How's it going, everybody? Carpo here. I wanted to make this quick, quick video. Try to make, try to lay this thought out that I had here about being happy or sad. And at first, I was going to make a video, and I was going to use a metaphor of a tug of war. And I realized how uh, how short that came to what I was trying to express. And then the ocean came to mind, and it instantly fit as a metaphor. And right then I realized, you cannot use human behaviors or games as a metaphor for things that are natural in order, unless the human game is something that represents that natu nature, or that natural order. I know that probably might not make sense to a lot of people, so I'm going to try to explain it as best I can. <clears throat> Almost everything that we experience in our lives if looked at close enough, follows what they call the archetypal pattern, or what I call the archetypal pattern. Um, and archetypes are basically symbols or representations that uh, the hero is an archetype, okay, the hero in the story. And that's just one example of many. All the characters and stories are various archetypes. And there are also, of course, allegories and stories and parables and things like that. But all of these explain, symbolically, things that we all go through in our lives. <coughs> and it's universal. It really is. It's, it's not something that we can escape or say that we, we're different. We all go through trials and tribulations. And this is what has brought about so many mystical teachings, religions, beliefs, ideas, hopes, faith. All these things came from our desire to understand ourselves and our world and our universe and say is there something else out there. So the archetypes in our lives help us to understand a little bit better that we're not alone. And back to the ocean metaphor or the archetype I was going to use, it was, it was about positive and negative thinking. And I've often used a river as an example for many of life's tribulations. Uh, you're, you can you can try to stop the current. You can try to drop an anchor. You can you can sometimes get caught in an eddy, but you're always moving. But the ocean, I thought, was a much better metaphor for positive and negative thinking. Now, all of us know that when you have a negative thought, it can amplify. This is expounded. I don't want to bring psychedelics into this, but there was some uh, discussion we were having a while back and uh, about how LSD seems to have, in some people, it can trigger a bad trip bad trip is basically a negative thought that someone has that resonates metaphorically in an echo chamber in their mind and it reinforces itself and it multiplies, multiplies until it seems like everything's crashing down around you. The reason it's amplified in a trip is because of the state of mind a person's in, but this happens to us all the time in our daily life. You wake up and you stub your toe, no big deal. Then you fall down, ah, and then you drop something, and then, you know, you're late for work, and then all of a sudden everything compounds, and you just feel like the whole world's crashing in, and then you start thinking of all the other things that you have to do, and it's just worse and worse and worse. It's a delicate balance. Now, I'd like to say that on the positive end of the spectrum, it's the same way, that you start thinking positive, and then it just compounds and compounds until everything's just great. It does, but it's much more subtle. And this is why I was going to use a tug-of-war analogy for it. As if positive and negative are pulling, but negative has a little more heft and weight to it. So you have to help resist the negativity. But I don't feel that that's true because I don't have to resist negative thinking. I maybe once did, but now that I've consciously become aware of my thoughts, and I analyze what I'm doing in my thoughts, I can laugh at myself and realize that I'm grumpy about something, or that I'm taking something out on someone else. These are things that we all need to understand about ourselves. So, to the archetype of the ocean, it's as if you're floating. Now, the crests and the troughs of the wave are the negative and positive. It doesn't matter which end. It's a yin and yang. In fact, they just look like a wave in their own sense. But if when you're at the bottom of a wave, which is the trough, you're in the, uh, let's say, you're at your low point and you, everything, it just seems bad in life, and you're not doing well. And when you're at the crest of your wave, things are great. Now, if you're on a calm ocean, and you've learned to balance it out, then things can be very mellow. 
and you don't really have too many ups or downs because it seems like whenever there's a really high up it comes with a crash and vice versa and this really got me thinking about if it's too calm because a side effect of the ocean being calm and everything being fine is that a slight disturbance can affect you much more the sharks are allowed to gather in calmer waters okay and this means that smaller perturbances may annoy you even 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 more or you may miss something but more than that when the seas are calm the winds are quiet and your sails not being not picking up and you need speed and you're not doing anything so when you're trying to avoid positive and negative by remaining completely neutral at all times i feel like we don't get enough wind to keep ourselves going now when there's a storm this it's a horrible thing if you're on a ship but the side effect of that is that the crests and the troughs will you know be more intense but the benefit from that is that your sail pushes you much farther because of those winds another part of this analogy is when the seas are calm it's much easier to see what's going on underneath the water see i'm not supporting that the seas should be rough i'm saying that when it is calm you have to be more careful and all you do is stick your head down into the water and you can see a whole new world down there. It's something completely foreign and alien to us, but it's there. We know it's there, but when you're on the boat, it just seems like a surface, you know, that that's the end of your world where the air stops. This is something that I think really helps me when I feel like I'm in a certain state of mind, not feeling up to the task of something, when I'm overwhelmed with responsibilities I don't want to succumb to. Um, these, are, these are the times when I set, step back and ask myself, first off, look at the big picture. One person asked me, how do you keep yourself from stressing if you're not stressed? And I say, well, I just remember that we're all going to die one day. But that was kind of a joke. It is true, but that doesn't negate our emotions from this life. It doesn't mean that we can't feel stressed out and anxious and worried about small things. We will do it, and they will compound themselves. I just had a friend of mine, actually, who came over this morning, and uh, he was talking about waking up in the middle of the night, and he said how he has a, a bed again, a good bed, so he's able to sleep more than a few hours without waking up and thinking about stuff. And I said, you know, ever since I had my sciatic pain, five, six years ago, it lasted a few years, I wasn't able to get out, I wasn't able to sleep a full night. I get up about every three hours on the clock, every night, at least twice I get up every night, and usually go to the bathroom, or just walk and stretch a little bit. That's because my back still needs a little bit of stretching, and during my sciatic episodes, it would get worse while I was sleeping. This made it difficult, let's say, to sleep. Anyhow, before that, I realized that I had woke up anyway. I'd always woken up in the middle of the night, and sometimes I'd wake up at 4 a.m. wide awake thinking about something that may be wrong at work, that I may have to fix. Little things, things that shouldn't bother me, but things that were bothering me. And I really, I share this a lot because I, I find it to be so important. And it's what I was telling him when he was over here. I was like, I used to stress like that. I used to wake up and panic. I used to wake up and worry about stuff. And perhaps I've lost that to a fault, to where I don't worry about even some of the things that do need to get done. In other words, maybe the ocean that relates to my motivation is too calm because I'm too placid about the whole thing. But I said... During the sciatic episode, and when I started taking Kratom, all these different things, it just kind of went away, that, that panic feel. And it wasn't until recently, when I was talking with someone else about this, who takes Kratom too, said that they haven't been anxious or felt, you know, any anxiety either. I sleep like a baby. I don't know if it's, uh, you know, I'm saying that I don't know, it could be drug-induced or the drug could add to it. Any, not, not Kratom, but any substance. I don't consider Kratom a drug, but a plant. But anything that alters either your perception, your body chemistry, the way you sleep, the way you think, or your energy level, these all can be drugs. And all of these affect us, not just in... It's difficult to know if you've reduced your stress. Here's the thing. I still can get anxious when I'm taking Kratom. 
and I still can get emotional. I can still get depressed. So I know that it's not messing with my emotions. But back when I was in extreme pain and I was taking uh, opiates, like Norcos, you know, which are Percocets, um, or sorry, uh, they're Vicodin, 10 milligram, but I was also taking Percocets. I've taken a variety of different things. They, they numb you. Real opiates numb you to emotion and it makes it difficult to laugh, cry, or really do anything. You're just a zombie. And I'm bringing this up because it's really important to remember when we're feeling down and out or when we're feeling elated, often this is due to something we've consumed or something we need to consume. If we're really down, we might just need the right protein. We might not. We might just be thirsty, dehydrated. That could be something very simple, but there could be chemistry issues within our brain and body that need to be resolved too. Whereas when we're extremely elated, that can be induced by either a pleasant experience or something that we've consumed, such as a substance. And I don't draw any real distinctions between the two. I know that a lot of people like to demonize drugs, such as MDMA, LSD, psilocybin, as if it's somehow cheating or escapism, when it's not at all. It's actually a very, uh, it's a very, well, for me, the experience can be almost frightening before I do it, because I know what I'm in for. I know that I'm going to have to go through an hour or so of uneasy feeling before I get to the enjoyment. And there will be some learning involved. But that alters the way that I think in a great way. And I don't know how much that affected me over my youth when I was taking these substances. You know, I, it's not like I was taking them all the time, but at least every other week we were taking something that would allow us to expand our mind to the point where I was accepting of the world the way it was. I understood that we were all one and... I've tried to carry that with me to help me be a happier person. But I also don't want to be too mellow about it. I don't want to be too relaxed. If you don't have a little bit of that fuck em up attitude, and for real, I mean, you've got to be able to really get your hands dirty when you need to. And I'm not talking violence here. I'm just, it's, it's the go get em type attitude. Just do it, Nike, whatever the hell you want to say. It all means to get off your ass and do something you need to do. There are small things we can do in our lives that really improve it. I know because when I do them, I feel great. And there are several of them I could do right now that I won't or that I haven't. And <clears throat> those are things I'm working on in my life. But I just tell you that because I want to make myself vulnerable. And I let you, the subscribers, know that I'm a human too. That I make mistakes, that I make errors, that I sit and ponder and worry about things sometimes. But that I've learned how to control it. And that's what I'm here to share. Is I want everybody to know that you, you really can change your mind, change your life. As this old ridiculous saying goes that most people take it to be about as realistic as the secret. Whereas you can just want what you want and get it by really wanting it. All of this is true to a degree. They've taken ancient mysticism, you know, the, the teachings of the, the mystery schools, and they've, they've twisted some of these simple ideas of accept who you are and where you are and, and, and live moment to moment to say, well, you have to live in the now. That one doesn't work, okay? I'm going to tell you right now, if you've heard that slogan about living in the now, it, it's what I do constantly. I'm always in the moment. But a lot of people misunderstand what it means and think that it means that you have to forget about your past and that you don't have to worry about any of your future. That's ludicrous. We all know that you have to make plans for your future. Squirrels aren't out there thinking deep think thoughts, but they're storing nuts for the winter. That is foresight. Whether it's programmed or otherwise, we know that we have to prepare ourselves somewhat. So living in the now means being aware of the future and understanding the past. Another thing that's misunderstood besides living in the now is that this whole idea of, you know, <clears throat> wish it, want it, do it, this whole have uh, the secret, which came out, you know, a decade or two ago, um, and Oprah was all over the secret, and the secret was like, you know, I think it was Deepak Chopra that wrote it, and, you know, a lot of these enlightened speakers, they're great, you know, they, I consider them to be um, filler for newbies, I don't mean that offensively, but people like um, 
<laughs> people like Deepak Chopra or Eckhart Tolle. It's kind of like surface stuff. And I would say the same thing about Alan Watts, who a lot of people revere. He was just a playful Zen type. You know, somebody's like, how could he be a teacher if he's just an alcoholic, you know, and he just mumbles. I'm like, he never said he was a teacher. He was just a student himself, and he was sharing his knowledge. That's what I am. I'm here sharing what I learned in my life without being a teacher about it. Because I know better. He knew better. You don't teach people. You plant seeds, and hopefully they grow in their minds. And if they don't, then it wasn't a worthy seed. It wasn't fertile. Or their minds weren't fertile. It doesn't mean that when you don't plant an idea and it doesn't come to fruition, or nobody understands you, it doesn't mean that your idea is right and they're wrong. It just means that when the two right people come together, the ideas mingle and understand. There are some very fine values that we all share. Very simple values that we all share. But there are a few of us who share very specific type values. Where we can, I mean, I'm the kind of person who doesn't play spiritual games. I don't try to be this very ultimate peaceful Buddhist type guy. If you get in my face, I'm going to knock you down. I mean, I'm that kind of guy. I'm not violent, but I'm saying if I have to defend myself, I'm not going to sit... I will try to talk myself out of any fight. I do not like physical confrontation. But when it comes to that, you know, I, I don't hold back thinking, oh, violence is unacceptable. Everything has a time and a place. There is no good and evil. And I've had that discussion. I know somebody might think, oh, there is evil. And the description I usually get is that a child molester or an abuser... And, that's what we define as evil, I agree. But in the sense of most things that aren't extreme, it's hard to define them as good or bad. They just are, and it depends on the situation and circumstance. With the exception of a few. Like, abuse like that, I mean, which is ludicrous. I, but that's another good example. Things like that. Child abuse, child endangerment, and child molestation. Those are the things that people don't like to talk about, but that are hugely important in our society, that we want to just close our eyes to. You know, back when all that shit came out about the priests and the Catholic Church molesting kids, that wasn't news to us. We knew it. It was just finally coming out mainstream. And still, they're not ashamed. They still protected their priests. It's disgusting. And this is supposed to be a religion that protects children, you know, in this life. Does that mean that all people in the church are corrupt and abusers? No, of course not. But that one value that's, prote that's protected, that one thing was enough to turn so many people away from the church. Because that is one thing that people won't accept. And that's a really good example. While I say that there are certain values I share with other people, there are also certain values that I will not accept in other people. If you don't agree with me on a certain subject, but we can get along on another, we can be friends, as long as we have something to talk about. But there are certain values that no matter how similar we are, if, you, if, if I'm with a friend and, and we both share all the same political, uh, religious, uh, moral values, yet they, um, they think it's okay to beat their wife, I can't be friends with them. I cannot be friends with someone who harms another person. Under any circumstances, I will not accept it. And it's because I don't turn a blind eye to abuse. I, I let people know that if, if I were to encounter that, which I haven't, none of my friends thankfully beat their women, but um, I have met a few acquaintances that do, and I, I make a quick haste and get the hell away from them. I, I don't accept abuse. That's one of the rules of my life, that physical confrontation and abuse is for weak and shallow people. There is, I'm not going to say there are absolutely no time when it's acceptable, but there are very few times when it's acceptable. If a person's protesting and cussing at you and screaming and they have a sign that's just the most horrific sign, even if it's, let's say it's on the abortion side where they're anti-abortion, and we have them down on the corner here, they come every year and hold up their fetus signs and uh, with little bloody fetuses on them, you know, it would be easy for a person to go up and just want to punch one of those guys, you know, and say, you don't have any right, but they do have a right. Because there's no reason to confront a person and abuse them over something like that. So why would it be okay to abuse your wife? Physically abuse your wife or children. That is just the one thing I'd really... I guess I'm running out of time here, but I'd like to leave on that note. 
physical abuse of children to me is, a, is preposterous. If anyone out there does it, shame on you. And you have no justification for doing so. It is improper. There's no excuse for it, no reason for it. My kids can be little shits. I got a three and a four and a seven year old, four and a seven year old, and they are hellions sometimes. But I do not beat them. I won't get into the spanking thing, you know. If your kids are really young and you have to protect them. This is the one case when it's acceptable, in my eyes, to spank your kids, is when they are in physical imminent danger. When they're going to touch a hot stove, play with an outlet, and they just won't stop, sometimes you have to whoop their butt, and that's true. But I'm talking about abusing a kid for talking back, or for saying something you don't like, or for disrespecting you. Because a real father or mother should be able to take verbal abuse from their own kid without being so weak that they have to lash out physically. And unfortunately, a lot of guys out there do beat their wives because in the rest of their life they're unhappy. Because they're little men. Because they have very unhappy lives. They don't like their job. They don't like where they ended up. They want to be free and go do what they want. Perhaps it's the kind of guy who <coughs> cheats on his wife. Which I'm not going to say that uh, I wouldn't associate with a person who cheated on their wife. I could probably still associate with them as a friend, but I, I wouldn't be able to get past that very well, because my thing is that you've made a promise, an oath to someone, and for your own selfish temporary gain, for sex, which is a primal instinct you haven't learned to control, you're willing to sacrifice and risk that. Not just risk your relationship for your sake, re risk harming someone else's heart, because heartache is real. We all know this. It's not a joke. Heartache can break people. And uh, so that's why it's important to not abuse. And that's why it's important not to harm people. And I wish there was more more love out there. There is a lot of abuse. And damn it, we really should stop it. But as long as we're allowing you know people to tell us how to live our lives, um, then we'll continue to suffer. You know, we, we, we need to speak out and stop accepting it when... If you know anyone who's an abuser, make it heard. Make yourself heard. Let them know that it's not right. And this is especially important for anybody who's in office, running for office, or anything that we have to sign, any type of local laws or elections that may relate to abuse. Um, trying to stop domestic violence, these types of things. People don't want to fund these things. And it's like, it's important. It's important. Because there are a lot of assholes out there that beat each other up. I just don't understand it. So anyway, I won't bore you with any more details. Peace out. Love you all.